lovely to have uh, Shane Hobart here, cinematographer, going to join us for a little Q&A. So, Shane, you've just finished your Illumination tour. What really motivated you to, to put this whole thing on, to come away from making movies? And, uh, and what, what, at the end of the experience, have you learned about the typical indie filmmaker in the States? Well, first off, I want to thank you very much for uh, conducting this interview. I think it's very important to kind of get the word out, especially about education that really benefits filmmakers all over the world. The Illumination Experience, why I did it, well, I mean, the Hurl blog is a perfect example of that. Uh, I've been sharing with uh, over a million people for over six years now. And it's, uh, it's a passion of mine. My, my parents were both educators. Uh, I love what I do. Uh, I'm very passionate about it. Uh, not many people uh, in the cinematography uh, field are very good behind the camera and in front of the camera. So that's one thing that I really love to do and love to get out and really educate the new filmmakers of the world. Um, it's, it's been kind of a really passion project for my wife and I. Uh, I had incredible, you know, Lydia and I have been working together on the Hurl blog for over six years now. And I had amazing mentors that kind of helped me and, uh, you know, shaped me as an artist. And I find that with this big push, with this revolution, with this democratization of filmmaking, the mentors things have kind of been pushed to the side. And I've been wanting to raise to the top and, and be able to help uh, you know, new filmmakers, uh, uh, you know, high, high professionals as well, uh, kind of define their craft and, uh, really tell, uh, more, you know, emotional stories. So it's the cinematography tour was not all about cinematography. It was about storytelling, uh, to its core and how you and what you and why you do things. So for me, uh, taking the time out of my schedule to do it, it was, it was kind of the, the perfect storm, let's say. Yeah. Uh, I had a, uh, an opportunity where I did a movie with Gabriel Muccino, Russell Crowe was starring in it, Amanda Seyfried, Aaron Paul, just the cast was insane. The movie was, uh, the script was incredible. Uh, the acting, the performances, the whole experience was one of those movies where you walk away from and say, okay, that was probably one of the greatest experiences of my life. Out of that, you're kind of, I had been doing so much action that this is finally a drama where it's where I started. I started in dramas. So finally I've, I've found my way back, which is what I love to do more than anything. So based on that, I said to myself, you know what? I'm really, you know, quenched creatively and I want to spend some time with my family. I only want to do one movie a year. So I've done the movie. So, we got back and, and Lydia and I started talking and, and uh, we said, if we're ever going to do this educational tour, we got a three month window before you start your next feature in January. This is it. If we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. So uh, we went for it and we whipped it together in less than six weeks. Uh, I had been working on the curriculum for over two years uh, after our last boot camp. So it was all there. It just needed to be shaped and morphed into, you know, a one day workshop and then a, a master class. But once we got the, the engines going and we brought in our whole team to kind of, you know, fabricate it and uh, the ideas just started flying. I mean, the course is off the hook. Uh, there's nothing like it out there. And, um, the uh, and now the new downloads that are just become available two or three days ago, it is uh, there's nothing like that on the market as well. I, so I saw your I read your tweet. So they're like ten hours of content 
something like that. Did it say 10 hours? Basically, it's like uh, just under eight hours, I think, for the workshop and just under uh, six hours for the master class. Uh, the, when the classes were done, it was 11 hours and 12 hours, which was the master class. But there's a lot of, you know, with the master class specifically, there's tons of times where you, you light a set and then the next team rolls in and the, we cut out all that stuff. Well, imagine every time a new team rolls in is half hour or so, right? So all that fat is trimmed so you really get uh, the, the golden nuggets and the, the educational value for, in a very condensed format. Overall, you're, uh, the people that came to the Illumination Tour, are these the filmmakers of the future? Really, are they, you know, uh, were there some great people coming to the top? Did you feel there, inspired? There was. It was a mixed bag. We had uh, from newbies all the way up to seasoned professionals. And uh, they were so absolutely inspiring. Uh, you know, in the morning, they thanked me for even taking the time to do this. At lunch, they thanked me. And at rap, they thanked me. I mean, it was just so absolutely incredible. And, you know, I, the, the curriculum was formatted so a newbie could take a really great chunk of it. A seasoned professional could take, could basically blow their mind. That's, that's what the beauty of it was. A seasoned professional, me taking 20 years of my experience on how I prep a movie, which is completely different than anyone else on the planet. And it's, it's basically the gold. Uh, it's the keys to the castle of prepping any kind of uh, you know, feature, commercial, just the way I go into it and, and why I do things and, and keeping everyone making one movie or one commercial or one documentary and how you do that. Uh, by systematizing and creating uh, the script, but the script has many things embedded into it that no normally are not embedded into a script. Yeah. So now all the people uh, are working on a script where they see the look, they see the shot list, they yeah. see it all start to happen. And it's something that I know, you know, I've been working in this business for over 26 years and I know it doesn't exist. Yeah. So that in itself is a mind blower to all, uh, you know, seasoned professionals out there. And that's what they just kept on telling me. They're like, oh my God. And then some went right into shooting their feature uh, within a week after doing the tour and they completely threw everything out yeah. that they were doing and redid everything. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's... Yeah. It's a whole kind of, you know, mind melt for them uh, of mm -hmm. seeing that. And then it's like the simplicity of just taking a face and showing the attendees what I'm looking at and why I'm not settling for the light to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I'm noticing how it's doing this to the face or that to the face. And then I'm not happy. You know, it was funny. It was when we went from the the kind of theoretical of why I did things and then went to the practical, they would be looking at the monitor and they were like, oh my God, this is it. This is amazing. And then I'd go in and I'd make another change and they're like, oh my God, I didn't think it could get any better, but oh my, what's, what's he doing now? What's he, holy shit. You know, it was like, it was that kind of way that I literally took a wide shot that was completely lit and we shot it. And then I went in for the close up and I systematically added one thing after the next, moving it, shaping it, changing it, this, there, and there. It just, you know, evolved right in front of them. And that was just the monstrous takeaway to see all the theory and why I was doing it and now how I did it. It's just, it's the best way to learn. And then the master class on top of that is even a better sense because now you see somebody like you, right? Uh, you're seeing somebody walk into a scene that uh, is using what they learned in the workshop and now trying to apply it in uh, a set and a set that they're, you know, they only have a half hour and I'm holding them to it and they have all these lights and they start to, you know, miss 
make miscalculation and missteps. And, uh, you know, uh, I remember there was one person that just like, I want to light here, 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 here. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, how, how, let's start with just one light, you know? <laughs> and then somebody like, Phil light was always the last light you added. And the first person that came up, he said, all right, let's get the fill over here. I'm like, whoa, 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 Phil light. No, that's last. Remember? And they're like, oh, yes. And so it was it was a lot of fun as well, you know, watching and and kind of letting them fail and then catching them and kind of guiding them. The reviews on just the masterclass uh, HD download is like this is the most amazing way to learn you know, where you're seeing systematically what the student is doing, and then you see me come in and correct it and redirect it. We went over this footage and over it and tried to cut it in a way that was so educational. And I think, you know, MZ and, and uh, Ben, the editor, and, and my wife and my whole team, David and Laura, really have made these uh, these things truly uh, incredible. Well, you're well known for adopting the 5D Mark II back in 2010, that sort of time, and you used it in Active Valor. That that looked an incredible use of that camera, being able to get into all those different positions. Uh, obviously, they they loved you using that camera. They wanted you to. Have Have you ever found um, any sort of resistance to using those kind of cameras on bigger budget films? Well, uh, have movie producers always been quite so open to it? The producing team that I was doing a lot of work with at the time, not only Active Valor, but a lot of my commercial work was, was Bandito Brothers. And they had produced Active Valor. And then we were doing all these commercials that their whole idea was, you know, small footprint, big vision. Okay. So it was all about the DSLR. So that just fueled tons of more content uh, coming out that uh, looked sometimes even better than what Active Valor looked like because I was honing the device as I was working with it, right? Uh, last three minutes that I did that short film directed by Po Chan, that was the culmination of everything that I learned that basically putting that DSLR in its best case scenario and its most real kind of lighting environments. And, uh, you know, that was a testament of everything that I'd learned on Active Valor and then took it and really said, okay, this is what we should do. And I think that, you know, over more than anything, uh, the resistance is from people. I have resistance with uh, a $70,000 Canon uh, C500. Nobody wants to use that, right? right? I, I come on a, on a commercial and they don't ever want to see a Canon. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, right. it, I, I have to force it down their throat. Right. Yeah, they want either a Lexa or they want a Red. And uh, so that's always been a fight. Yeah. Uh, so, but, you know, I've shot 19 feature films and, you know, 16 of them have been on film, yeah. right? So we're looking at a very small margin of digital capture. Yeah. Uh, I just have a, kind of a big voice. So, uh, and I've spread it over a lot of different formats. Yeah. So, you know, you're able to take... Uh, I'm not shooting on just one. I'm taking the best aspects of each camera and that, that sensor and then trying to utilize it to help tell my story better. And it's not about just one camera. It's about a multitude of cameras that will help tell that story. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. awesome. So let, let, let's, go, um, let's go a little further back. Uh, you work with um, the legendary photographer Herb Ritz. How did that um, shape you as a cinematographer? Yeah, working with Herb Ritz was probably one of the most influential experiences of my life. Uh, he was a, a master of, uh, and, and his talent was not only his photography and his composition, but it was the talent to hire and surround himself with amazing people. And uh, you just, that talent uh, when someone has it, they're always the best at what they do. And uh, he surrounded himself with the best. 
And uh, I traveled all over the world with that man. And I learned so much about lighting a face and, and being able to, and this is what we went into uh, on the illumination experience with my light study. I mean, I was showing people all these different light placements of how I lit with Herb as well as how I lit with movies. And they saw it live action and they saw it as a still frame. And people were just blown away with the placement of the light. And, and just a, a, I'm just talking like three degrees back would be the difference between beauty and her being not so beautiful or a little more damaged or kind of, uh, you know, not sure of herself. Or now all of a sudden the light comes around and she has, she's powerful and she's alive. And, you know, and, and that's, really what I learned from Herb and uh, along with his composition style. His compositions were elegant, but always something was very interesting about him. They were what I would call slightly off. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't classic. Yeah. Uh, and I really loved that and have taken a lot of that in my photography. As a student in media, I uh, we you know you do a lot of deconstruction of images, and I think uh, it it does help to be able to understand your composition. And you know, if you if you understand what the connotations are, then you can sculpt what it is that you're seeing in the frame. When you think about it, uh, you know your your master, your wide shot, setting that mood, setting the tone is is so important. But the emotion is in the medium and the close-up and how you bring that power or, or that damaged or that insecure or uh, that handsome or the beauty, whatever the emotion is to that scene, yeah. how you bring that out is so important. And uh, it's everything. It's, it's everything on how you connect with, with the actor and their emotion motion, uh, whether they tr transport you or not, uh, whether you're engaged, whether you're immersed, uh, is all in that performance. Yeah, yeah. There's... Sorry, I lost you there for a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's, mine's, my, my scope is, 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 is fading in and out. It's all good, I can still see it. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, something that I saw today uh, was a video about the use of comedy and drama by Jackie Chan showing you how he integrates both these things into single shots and how that action and reaction in the same shot helps to engage you more with the characters. I've, I've certainly found that very interesting with, uh, with regards to editing and composition. Just letting an actors hold the frame and actually act as opposed to trying to um, let all the action be motivated almost in post in the cutting so every time anyone does anything it's ba 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 yeah I, I think it's magic it even it reminded me of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers in Top Hat they just lock the camera off and this guy does his thing and you're watching him sing, you're watching Ginger's reaction to him singing. And I'm thinking, when are they going to cut away from this? Uh, 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 uh. And it's like minute and a half, halfway through the song when he stands up and it's a perfect time to cut because you need the wine. And yeah, I, I find a bit of deconstruction in the old movies. There's a hell of a lot you can learn from that. Or oh, that I can learn. It's, uh, I... Uh, I digress. Anyway, sorry. I'll keep. I'll well, no, no. I mean, I think that the fathers and daughters was a perfect example of that. I think that uh, in the whole movie there might be under a thousand cuts, uh, right? In Need for Speed, uh, there is a thousand cuts to two thousand cuts per reel. Okay, <laughs> so we're talking like near ten thousand cuts in that film where uh, Fathers and Daughters, Gabriel Muccino is very much about letting the actors play in a space and, and setting up frames that really have an emotional impact as well as a good and incredible storytelling impact as well. Uh, we set this scene up uh, with Russell Crowe and his small little daughter. Uh, they were at... Um, 
the Museum of uh, Natural History in New York City, and uh, they're looking at a T Rex. Yeah. And uh, her mother had died. So she looked over and she saw a mom with her daughter. So we're, we, we see that. And then we cut wide back behind them. So we see the mom. We see Russell. We see the little girl. Uh, and then the little girl moves to the right. And the camera pans with her. Yeah. And then Russell Crowe goes over and kneels down and has a conversation with her. Yeah. The camera just doing that slight pan yeah. was huge emotionally. Because yeah. you saw her emotions and immediately with the pan it said, okay, my wheels are turning, you know, I, I miss my mom, what's going on? Is my dad gonna die? Am I gonna be alone? I'm eight years old and you know, it's like this whole, uh, craziness of where her mind was going was just initiated on that pan. Yeah. We didn't cut. We didn't go in for the close-ups yet. We just panned and let her move over there, let Russell Crowe over there. Yeah. Russell Crowe kind of reveals the, the mom in the distance, and then we go in for the coverage. Right. It's so precious. Yeah, yeah, totally. It sounds, it sounds like that. you captured that moment, just that yes a little revelation and, and that sounds epic i can't wait to see it is that uh, great movie making this i i i've done uh you know like i said 19 features uh i uh i've never cried so much in a uh, color correction session uh i went through three boxes of tissues oh. Uh, yeah, it was it was insane. I mean, this movie is a roller coaster of emotion, and uh, I have a daughter, uh, so that father and daughter relationship is so huge and so. I mean, that's what kind of grabbed me in Interstellar as well. That father daughter relationship is yeah. one of the most amazing ones to play on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I have I have two too. Uh, so yeah. it's. Uh, it's it's hard even when i talked to my father about my daughter and she ran into the room one night and said some daddy daddy someone's chased someone you know she's having a bad dream someone's chasing me and i leapt out of bed onto the floor and grabbed her and it just honestly i i could feel myself breaking up even talking about it now it's just yeah. the power of of the you know what it is when you've got a, a child um, if you can capture that on, on, on film and those kind of moments, oh, it's... The relationship and her with Russell. And Russell is so much... He's such an incredible actor. I mean, he's within the top three in the world right now, I think. And uh, this really kind of puts him back in the whole uh, place of like a beautiful mind. Uh, not so much an action hero, but uh, a really... Uh, an incredible performance and, and just his nuance and yeah. subtleties are just so spot on. Yeah, he's got a sensitive side, you can tell that he's, oh, yeah. he's that yeah. kind of guy. So, um, Shane, when you when you you must get a lot of scripts, that must be quite a difficult thing for you to go through and, and make some decisions on what what you're going to do, uh, which ones. So, what what kind of is it? when you read a script that makes it click with you, that makes you want to do it? Well, there's, there's several things. Uh, one, if it's something I've never done before, right? That's, that's uh, one of the, the key things that motivates me. Uh, when I did Terminator Salvation, I had done my big $200 million tentpole movie. Uh, and then these guys came up to me and said, hey, uh, I want you to shoot this action movie. I'm like, I, I don't want to shoot action. Uh, yeah, but it's following these Navy SEALs on real missions all over the world, and uh, we want to do this really differently. I'm like, okay, that sounds kind of cool. And then I just started to play with the 5D. I'm like, what if we're able to shoot this whole thing on a still camera? They're like, oh, yeah, let's do that. And it's like, okay, that, that's a whole different you know, that's a whole innovation pioneering process. So it's nothing like the $200 million tentpole. Now we're making like this little $11 million movie with at the most 50 people at, uh, and the most of the time 10 and under. Yeah. 
yeah. right? Wow. So that had uh, an, a, a really good emotional uh, appeal for me because I hadn't made a movie like that. Sure. And sure. it got me back to the core filmmaking, you know, uh, spirit of having to do everything. I mean, yeah. not only was I the director of photography, I was the gaffer in a lot of locations, I was the key grip in a lot of locations, and I was the travel coordinator, yeah. booking all the flights booking all the hotels, everything. We had to multitask because at most of the time we only had 10 people. That was it. And, and we, would, we would do major action events with five people. You know, script-wise, I get a lot of scripts in. Uh, you know, my agent is a filter as well. So a lot of them, they're just kicked to the side because uh, he knows my aesthetic and what I'm going for. When Fathers and Daughters came in, he felt it was the perfect drama for me to kind of get out of the action yeah. world for this. And so that's why I did that. Uh, I'm up for another movie called Inversion that uh, is a thing I've never done before. It has a ton of blue screen and green screen and stage work. So uh, building sets that kind of go upside down and everything. So that's very exciting for me because I've never done that. Uh, and uh, I think the look of it, uh, I think I'm going to shoot it on film. Uh, so that's going to be really cool getting back to that. It's what I'm looking for is is great characters. I'm looking for uh, whether it's a love story, whether it's a, a thriller, you know, the intensity of it, how I can immerse the audience. Is there a, a good visual element to it as well to, to help in the story? Have I not done it before? Uh, you know, those are the kind of key components that I'm looking for of how I can stamp you know, my my look and feel in a way that is in a story assist mode, not a look at me, look at me kind of mode, but how I can emotionally help the director through lighting and through camera, yeah. you know, deliver the impact. A true collaborator. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I find that anytime somebody says they want to look, for a movie, I'm probably not going to be doing that. <laughs> it's just, it defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. The look should be for the piece, not, so, and it's, it's what uh, Roger Deakins had a wonderful line in this round table discussion that they did with variety or Hollywood reporter. Yeah. He says, if you're mentioned for your photography and your reviews, that's usually not a good thing. <laughs> and it's the truth yeah. when they mention the photography there's something obviously wrong with the movie right when it comes like this you know and and he said that a lot of reviewers you know beautiful is thrown around thrown around so easily and if the movie isn't beautiful then it's not good cinematography well of course we all know that's not true but uh you know it's I thought it was very telling for Roger Deakin to say exactly that. And because uh, there are a lot of movies that the photography has been mentioned in the, the movie and uh, the, the photography is what set it apart and the movie was really lacking. So, you know, when there's trying to bring some things to the forefront, it's because the story in itself is not really engaging. So, um, Besides um, uh, your your shooting, do you ever do you ever edit? I mean, what's your relationship like in terms of the the post production yeah, process? I, how I, do you how do you fit in with post production? So post production wise, I work very closely with you know obviously visual effects, uh, rendering images, uh, color correcting those, getting those ready uh, for the whole uh, process. Uh, as well as working with the CGI artists to light scenes as well. Uh, I'm working with them to assist in the, the lighting of the sets and stuff from a uh, CGI lighting perspective. Um, 
in the editing process, basically I'll see a rough cut and I will work, come in with the director and the editor and just make suggestions, uh, suggestions of, I remembered a shot that you could have gone to, or, uh, you know, the pacing is off. I think you want to hold on this just a little bit, or, you know, just kind of, you know, or big sweeping things like, when I saw Fathers and Daughters the first time, I thought the pacing was all wrong and the structure was all wrong. And, you know, you sat with the director and said, you know, let's just follow the script, man, so people really understand what's going on. And uh, once they started to put it like the script, oh, my God, now it just it's so Own, you know, so uh, I'm as involved as I can be in this process. Uh, Obviously, it's something for the director and the editor and the producers to really finesse. And uh, directors that are true collaborators will invite you into this process very early on and ask your opinion. And I don't have a problem giving it. Uh, I I'm not somebody that is going to sugarcoat them and tell them exactly what everyone has been telling them. I will tell them it sucks or wow, it's great. And that's what they like about me because I am very honest. Way to be, especially when uh... you have to be, because just to to kind of it, it's it's a disservice to the director, it's a disservice to the project, it's a disservice to everything that you help create uh, as as a team if you don't at least give your honest opinion and not one that is sugar coated in a way is that really doesn't educate or inform. Oh yeah, totally. I. I've sat in, I, I just did a project last year with, uh, and I co-directed it with someone, and we sat together editing, and it was uh, such a breath of fresh air to uh, to do that, and have someone say, oh, just like you're saying, you know, let's frame it slightly differently here. We, we letterboxed it, we had space with lots of drone shots, and we thought, we can do something extra here, we can focus in on the water is fly fishing. We can focus in on the water, come in, and then pan up. And we can do that in post. We can just add this little move. It's a little tiny reveal. It's nothing, nothing made. It doesn't seem like anything much, but actually you, you, the shot then has a, an extra purpose. It says water, and then it says fisherman. It's not from everything. Eyes are so greedy. Right. <laughs> anyway. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> well, What's the most satisfying part about being a cinematographer? Is it is it making the films, or do you like kind of the post part of it in as much as watching an audience's reaction? I think it's a complete package. It's like making a movie is uh, you know it's a war, right? Uh, you you go into battle and you're battling the schedule, battling the budget, battling uh, you know availability. The actors battling other nature, you know, all of them are are playing into this wonderful, uh, you know, creation process. Um, but I think you know, making the movie is is incredibly rewarding. I think the uh, the cinematographer has the best job in the movie business. Uh, I've been to places that that no other people and uh, you know are ever going to go to. Uh, I, I've experienced uh, so many different things. I think there's only twelve countries I've never been to. Uh, so you know, it's like that in itself is pretty awe-inspiring as well as just the the culture and what you take in and what you absorb through architecture through light through the cultural the people uh and 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 and, uh kind of uh them inspiring you in many ways uh but then after it's all done and and you've you've kind of done the photography and you've done all the grading process and and then the soundtrack is added and and you're in that theater in the darkened room and they laugh and they jump back and they you know the look on their face and they cry and that is that's the climax, you know, that's, that's what all the, the battles and the fights and the wars that have been won, uh, you know, it's all worth it at that point, you know, and, and it's, I, I go systematically go every night when my film opens 
to a different movie theater uh, all across, you know, Los Angeles, trying to take in the perspective of, you know, the suburbs, the, you know, downtown Hollywood, uh, moving out to Pasadena, you know, just to, to take in everyone's experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, me. So uh, that actually was kind of brings me through to the, my, my final question about uh, when was the last time you went to a cinema and, and kind of sneaked a peek at, uh, at an audience kind of spellbound by a movie. Some of my favourite memories of going to the cinema are watching people all completely in one, under one roof feeling the same thing, you know. I think that's, that's incredible. Well, that's, that's where I think, you know, as much of like what Netflix is doing to try and get all this streaming and now they're, they're major, making major buys and, and really attracting amazing talent, you know, it's one thing to watch it in your home theater or in your living room or whatever, but it's another to get in that darkened room and the lights come down and the sound. I mean, I, I remember my first feature, which was my first theatrical feature, which was The Skulls. Yeah. And for so many years as a, as a, as a kid, that universal you know, uh, dun, 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 you know, and the globe comes up and yeah. the, the universal yeah. labels comes out. <laughs> and I remember sitting in the theater the first night that thing opened and I looked back at the people and they're just all looking at that. And I was like, holy shit, I shot my first theatrical feature. <laughs> and this is awesome, you know? And, uh, you know, you have that time where you just kind of watch other people react. I mean, uh, oh, my God, so many movies. Godfather, uh, Forrest Gump. I saw Interstellar uh, and just seeing the people and how they reacted to that, uh, the relationships. Uh, you know, that's very, very powerful experiences. The laugh more than anything. Uh, my daughter and I, I... We've been watching, because uh, it's streaming on Netflix, uh, Django Unchained, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, that movie, I love Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. I, I think he's a master at what he does. His, his over-the-top blood is, you know, my kids love it. Yeah. Uh, and it's just hilarious at the same time, bitingly realistic, too. Uh, and there's a whole, you know, Klu Klux Klan KKK thing in there, which is absolutely hilarious beyond belief. And my kids and I are just falling over in laughter. And that's, you know, what movies are about. It's like their relationship, even though it's the family there or an audience with 400, 800 people, just a collective volume of laughter, a collective volume of... <gasps> You know, I mean, it's just like, oh, God, it just takes your breath away as an artist. I think it's, I, it, it inspires me to do whatever, whatever I do. It inspires me to do that, yeah. you know, to, to transport an audience, to take them to a different time, to take them to a mood that scares them, that puts them on edge, uh, to light it in a way that it's depressing, but it's absolutely golden, beautiful. So you're crying, but you're also, I mean, it's, it's all that. It's just so, so uh, rewarding, let's say, to, to watch that. And there, there's flops as well. There's stuff that doesn't do that. And you go to the theater and there are not as many people as you had hoped. And, and you put your heart and soul into a project and, and you believed in it, but it didn't strike the chord. Uh, you know, it's like that's like with anything, you know, that Van Gogh made a made thousands of pictures that never saw uh, the light of day. He he trashed them. Well, any you know, the artist, you know, that that's why should it be any different? <laughs> sure, sure. You got to keep on keeping on, though. Take your own pet projects. And well, I know I do. Yeah. I'm forever doing things which you think this could work out. It could just fall flat on its face. But. I'm sure it's all going to learn something from it. I know that. Yeah, absolutely. I never, you always learn. Uh, so uh, you say you've got a, a movie scheduled for early next year? Yeah, right now I'm doing commercials and stuff to kind of uh, fill in the blanks. And uh, we have uh, the inner circle that we launched 
on the Hurl blog, which has been a, a passion project for my wife and I. Uh, you know, so many people have wanted more in depth, more intimacy with me. So we created the inner circle to uh, give people that. It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy uh, from me. I love doing it, but each six month section, and we divide it up into six months because that's the only way I can get my head around it, uh, is about 800 hours of my time. So, yeah, that's what uh, the first six months uh, was. So we're now moving to the next six months. For filmmakers all over the world, uh, this really gives them a glimpse of, of how and why I do things and how the movie business works and, and just storytelling in general. It's not so much cinematography based. Yeah. It, it truly is, is, uh, helps you in many ways. People uh, are taking it and they're saying that it helps them write better and they're writers and their inner circle members. Uh, directors find that it's it's a, a way to understand the mind of a, of a cinematographer so they can collaborate better with them. Production design, uh, there's a lot of amazing elements to uh, this, uh, this inner circle and, and what it's about and the intimacy of creating this kind of secret society Facebook page where if you literally ask a question, I'm answering it uh, in, in almost real time. I don't know any forum on the planet that delivers that. No, true. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> and it, and uh, yeah, I I, uh, I I took a look at it, and I think for for the, the price, I mean, it's in in the equivalent UK price, it's like the same as a a normal movie uh, review magazine. I mean, if you're oh, yeah. interested in production, yeah, that's if you just can afford, if you can value. afford a latte and a piece of banana bread, <laughs> uh, you know, you'd be signing up for this baby. Uh, it's just uh, we made it very inexpensive, uh, kind of the Netflix for filmmakers and storytellers, and uh, we were able to do that with all our amazing sponsors uh, that have put a, a good amount of money into the quiver to you know finance my team of of people that help bring this all together fantastic well shane yeah. thank you very much for your time and oh you're uh, very welcome it's, thank uh, you. it's been a pleasure speaking with you and finding out all about your filmmaking journey and all about technology and uh storytelling and well i uh, wish you all the best from chilly old england <laughs> all right thank you so much <laughs> all right take care